it's not there anymore. So yeah, so basically just as a way of introduction, I'm like a fifth year resident, I guess. Um, so I'm one of the research fellows at Yale and I'm in emergency medicine. So if you guys like emergency medicine, uh, I'm, I like you guys immensely better, but I also like people who don't like emergency medicine too. You know, we all work together. Um, as I was saying, really the purpose of this talk today isn't for me to like talk about all of this different research stuff that I've been doing. It's really to think about from my perspective, what can I like aid you guys in when thinking about the local Asian American communities you have and what are ways potentially that we can bring in qualitative research to answer the needs of the communities that you guys are part of. Uh, just as a quick timeline, first, we've kind of already done this, which is great, um, but we'll just kind of learn a little bit about who we have here today. And then I'll give a very brief, very, very brief primer about what is qualitative research. Um, and then I'll give two case studies basically of how it's being used within the space of Asian American health. And then I'll talk essentially at the end for both some ideas um, that I have in terms of things that you guys could get involved in. And then second is things or questions I have for you guys of potentially um, kind of working with the communities that you have in the area that you guys are going to medical school at. So those are just my thoughts. We'll see what happens. Um, hopefully we'll end early, like 8 p.m. So, you know, I can wash the dishes before my wife comes home, basically. Um, and I feel like because we're on Zoom, I'm uh, obligated to say that I would love it if you guys could turn on your cameras, but it's totally not obligated. It's totally up to you. Okay, so who we have in the room, um, it looks like we have at least two third years, some second years, some first years, and a mix of people who do qualitative research and not, and some people who are interested in like specific disparities and health kind of issues amongst communities within the umbrella term Asian America, which I love. And I love how you guys are kind of already disaggregating. And I, I feel like this is a new generation where that word didn't really exist in my vocabulary uh, when I was at least a first year medical student. And so that's great. Um, I don't know if everyone chimed in. So if you guys haven't, feel free to add it in the chat or you can just say like, introduce yourself in person. Totally happy with that too. Um, Anyone? Okay. I'm gonna move on then. Love it. Um, okay, so first, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about qualitative research. So you guys are all probably familiar with quantitative research, right? So this is like, do a statistical test, look for a p-value that's less than 0 0.05, and then that tells you something significant, right? That's what we're all taught. We think about sensitivity, we think about specificity, we think about number needed to treat, all of these terms that if you don't already know, you'll probably learn by the end of your medical school, if not earlier. Qualitative research is a little bit different in that we're not really thinking about the like the impact of an intervention per se, but we're really interested in what exactly is happening, right? So take, for example, um, say there's a patient who, like a demographic group who's having more heart attacks than other communities. Why is that happening? So really digging deep into the event or the phenomena that's causing something so really thinking about things that you can't um, quantify from like a numeric perspective. We're thinking about these problems and exploring them outside of like an Excel sheet or using R or any sort of programming software um, because they're things that maybe are, the numbers are too small or they're things that we really don't know like what the variables are. Um, so for example, if for the case about heart attacks, maybe it's like a diet choice or some sort of like social factor that links that community together 
that's explaining why they're having more heart attacks as compared to another group. And it's exploring it qualitatively. And once we figure out potentially what these variables are, they could be studied quantitatively, but really exploring the problem is the main focus of qualitative research. And a lot of this is not really thinking about the what's the effect, as I said earlier, but it's the why something occurs or how something happens. For us, and this is really what brought me into qualitative research, it's thinking about what populations are not talked about in research and how do we basically empower them to have a voice within the space of research, right? So classically, right, Asian Americans, we think about, oh, Asians are included in research, as in they're there, there's people who are Asian who are doing research. Um, but it's really interesting when we dig into that umbrella term, Asian American, um, how do we use qualitative research to highlight communities that aren't kind of the, I guess, what the United States would call the typical Asian American, right? So thinking about kind of like the minority groups within Asian America, thinking about the Hmong population, the Cambodian population, I would say most of the Southeast Asian population, a lot of the South Asian population, also thinking about Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. How do you bring those groups up? Um, especially in communities where, you know, there's not a lot of them. So you can't do that quantitative research. And then lastly, really, it's thinking about how do you contribute to the existing literature to add that nuance? Or for the space of Asian American research, how do you create new literature, right? So most demographic groups within Asian America don't even have research being done on them, don't even like really look into those communities, except at very, very small levels. So I think potentially as a PAMS has kind of spread its wings to all of these different medical schools, it's perhaps a pretty good opportunity just to think about what can local APAMSA chapters do to improve the communities that are local to that medical school. So just as a case study, uh, just to kind of give you an example of what qualitative research could be used for, um, we know specifically in the world of diabetes, for those of you guys who don't know, um, in 2015, so right when I was starting medical school, the American Heart Association made it so that Asian women, the BMI cutoff for screening for diabetes um, was made two points lower by BMI screening. And it was obviously different from any other demographic group in the country. And it was just like a weird thing. Like, why is this happening? Um, and they talked about like body fat distribution and all of that stuff. But that's not the point of today. Um, what I want you guys to think about is that it was recognized almost 10 years ago that there was a difference in just like the prevalence of diabetes. And diabetes just presented in people who were not as obese in the Asian American population. We also know that there are more diabetics in the Asian American community than the non-Hispanic white community. And we know that there's a lot of variation within the Asian American community, namely that South Asians and Southeast Asians struggle with it a lot more than East Asian populations. Included in this, we also have to think about mortality, right? So, right, so this is all quantitative stuff. And when we disaggregate, we find that the Filipino community, those who have diabetes have an incredibly high mortality rate, right? So this is like 19, 16 to 19% based off of if you're male or female. While for example, the Chinese community, we're talking about a 10 to 11%, right? So that's double the Chinese community ish. This is not perfect statistics. Um, and then also you'll see in the, the last row, compared to the non-Hispanic white community, the Filipino American population is almost two times as higher chance of dying from a basically a diabetes related event. So the question that you know we're looking at today and the case here is thinking about a qualitative perspective. So we're finding all of these differences within a population. So why does this occur? In the previous slide at the very bottom, I'm not sure if you're able to read this, but it's basically proposing different reasons 
for why these subgroups have a higher mortality rate related to diabetes. One of them is looking at socioeconomic position, talking about discrimination, and then also different environments are broadly classified as social determinants of health. So when we think about that, then we're like, well, let's say like the Chinese American community, how does the, the culture of just being Chinese American, how does that shape potentially diabetes management, right? And this isn't my research, but this is just a case study of it. So amongst first gen Chinese Americans, so those who are born outside the United States and came here basically in their adulthood, there's a lot of really interesting phenomena that are described through qualitative research. One is this concept, which I was really surprised about, but um, it's something that my parents who are Chinese American first gen um, talk about a lot, but how disease really isn't like the, just the disease, it causes an imbalance and it destabilizes the person. So in this qualitative study that I'm quoting, um, the patient uh, who is being interviewed basically describes how diabetes causes anger. And then because they have diabetes, it leads to a lot of these strong negative emotions. And the impact of it is that it impacts their family and kind of the, the family dynamics. And they have to kind of control themselves um, in terms of their anger. And it's all blamed on diabetes. So it's this weird interesting concept that I never really thought about before reading this paper that, you know, diabetes isn't just the disease that you're treating, but thinking about kind of uh, how it changes the emotions and also how specifically in this paper, it leads to problems between couples. Also in this paper, which for those of you, I would say all of you here probably, uh, I, I kind of laughed at this. It's this quote of, if you don't eat rice, can you sustain your daily living? Um, and when I was reading this paper, I was ironically eating rice and it was, it was a whole thing. Um, but basically it's this understanding that in diabetes management, one of the core parts of it is diet changes and all the diet changes being done classically taught don't focus or provide any details related to, say, for example, foods typical to Chinese Americans. I know, for example, like I don't have diabetes, but when I think about like diet and weight loss and all of that stuff, I'm like, how do I do that with the food that I cook? Like I, I'm like a, you know, I love fried rice and I love cooking like a lot of kimchi fried rice because my wife likes that. But like, all the conversations related to diabetes say don't eat rice or decrease your intake of rice. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do that, right? So all that to say, like, it's really easy to think about why this is a problem just as someone who is Chinese American and thinking about it. Um, and then thinking about like, if you have diabetes, how is this gonna impact your life? How can you like go out to eat with friends if you're immersed in a community of, for example, in this case, Chinese Americans. And I mentioned this already earlier, um, but just to add to it, the food restrictions wasn't just a, the food didn't look like the food that I ate. It was also specifically in this community, an idea of this balancing of foods. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but my dad's like a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And he always talks about hot and cold foods. You know, it's like, if you eat this, it's a hot food, so it's good this time. Or it's a cold food, it's good during this time. And I'm just always annoyed when he says that. But I always think about food as like, a, oh, well, I had this, so now I should have this to balance it out, right? And I think this is important because what I learned in this study specifically is that this idea of balanced foods of hot and cold even if you don't really think about traditional Chinese medicine, seems to be kind of really deep to the perspective of eating food, like in at least the Chinese American community. And there's been studies, especially within the Korean American community that also replicates this. Um, but I'm sure at least to some extent, it, it extends to other Asian American communities. But when you look at diabetes management from a qualitative perspective, in non-Hispanic white communities or black communities, this is like 
not a conversation at all. It's like really not a thing. And this is where qualitative methods is really interesting, right? So you take this idea and then you think, okay, this is a hypothesis that's now generated, right? So really this concept of balancing foods, these concepts of traditional Chinese medicine are really inherent to food conversations within uh, kind of Chinese American communities. So if we focus on that, will that have an impact on specifically diabetes management? And that's where you get into these things, right? So on here, two papers, two ongoing clinical trials, looking at exactly that, right? So if you do nutritional counseling that really focuses on this idea of balancing, on this idea of really the concepts, at least behind traditional Chinese medicine, when you're looking specifically at diabetes management in Chinese Americans, does it work, right? All this to say, you'll notice that the papers are like in 2021 and 2022, they're all feasibility studies. So these are new concepts that are born from these qualitative studies. So thinking about, can you do counseling that focuses not just on providing pictures of what type of Chinese food to eat that we're used to eating, or when I say that we are, I'm meaning me as a Chinese American, um, but then also can you use different social media networking apps, like, um, like in Chinese communities, it's WeChat, for example, to provide focused interventions for diabetes management, right? Now I'm gonna provide a slightly different context to the same conversation about diabetes management. So a different study looks specifically in the Filipino American community, right? So same question, how does Filipino American culture shape diabetes management? Interestingly, right, in a, in a United States context, you would assume that all Asian Americans are gonna have the similar struggles related to diabetes management. But we're finding here that there's differences. So similar, but there's key differences. Within this population, people are really not talking a lot about this like emotional changes and how diabetes imbalances a person. Rather, it's talking about a lot of shame and stigma related to any disease and how in at least these participants prioritizing family needs was so important relative to personal health that that was often the that was the most cited reason for why they didn't manage their diabetes. They were like, well, I have to prioritize the family. And a lot of the quotes from these conversations were, well, my family, a lot of our gatherings are around social eating events. And if I'm not eating, that's like a conflict with my whole family. So I, it's not an option to choose not to eat or to reduce the eating I'm doing because it kind of goes against my whole culture, which I was like, I mean, that's like not the case at all for the family that I'm part of, but I'm Chinese American. So like, this is like a radical difference. There's also similarities, right? Rice again was a big concept that was repeated over and over again in these interviews, uh, even more so interestingly than the Chinese participants, this one was thinking, talking about rice as like a, if you don't eat it, it's going to reject kind of the culture that they grew up in. And then this really interesting concept that I'm not going to pronounce, um, but basically it's this communal unity. So a lot of the participants proposed that the way to successfully manage diabetes is not to counsel the individual but it's to provide kind of community education. Um, so a lot of the, basically the proposed clinical trials and education events around diabetes management in Filipino Americans has started turning towards, very interestingly, community education events, having what they're calling social storytelling over food. So it's like a very visual sharing of what foods within that community are preferred in terms of recommendations for diabetes control. Um, and then a lot of targeting of stigma related to discussions on diabetes, right? So we have the, the Chinese American community really focused on this concept of balancing food 
And then a totally different priority amongst the Filipino American community, really focusing on community education as a target. So all that to say, I'm gonna take a brief pause here to see if you guys have any questions. Um, what do you guys think about this? Like, is this like total BS? Like, I don't know, I don't believe in all this qualitative research, which is fine. That's fine too. Um, what do you think about these brief statements I'm making uh, about these two individual communities? Any thoughts? I'm okay with no thoughts too. Cool. No I can thoughts? jump in real quick. Um, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing this up. I think it's super interesting because I'm also Chinese American. And like when you talked about the balancing foods, I thought that was so interesting because like my like parents and grandparents would say the same thing. They'll be like, oh, like if you eat too much of one thing, like you're going to get like canker sores or I don't know what the Chinese word for it is, but she'll be like, yeah, you, like don't eat too many mangoes or stuff like that. And obviously like me being a teenager was like, I'm going to eat whatever I want. And like, you know, the next day you get like canker sores and you're like, wow, I should have listened. So I think that like there definitely has to be more like work done in terms of like looking at um, like these balancing foods, hot and cold, because obviously like there is some like scientific basis towards it. And like as a Chinese American, like that's what we believe in. Like we don't believe in the science of or like my parents at least don't believe in the science of things. They believe in what they were taught as adults, um, as children. So it's like if you want to reach these communities and if you want them to have this like sustainable change, like this is how you have to talk to them versus like trying to explain things to them in a scientific way. Yeah, so I th thought that was really interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, it was fascinating. Like this is not like New Haven does not have a Chinese population. It doesn't have an Asian population. So like this is not research I can do right now. But it's so fascinating to read these papers and it really speaks to you in this case, it sounds like at a very personal level, right? Like you, you're like, oh my God, I'm also like, ah, I need to watch my weight or else diabetes, this is bad. Anyway, um, thank you so much. Any other thoughts? Thank you again also for sharing this. I was curious as to how the communal unity aspect was uh, elucidated in the sense of like how they figured that out for the Filipino community, but maybe not the... Chinese American Yeah, so what I'll say is these were two totally separate studies focusing on the communities within where the researchers were, right? So to add a little bit of context, the Chinese American community, this qualitative study was done in New York amongst, obviously, I don't know, if, I'm sure you're aware of this, a huge population of Chinese Americans, primarily first gen. In this kind of community, they were English and Mandarin speaking, but there are a lot of only Mandarin or only Cantonese speaking populations within New York specifically. And then the Filipino community, these were all participants actually from Hawaii. Um, so a huge difference, right? And the important thing I am emphasizing here the differences within Asian ethnic groups, but it's also like every community is going to be different, right? And it's not that these, these interviews were specifically differentiating between like, or elucidating specifically this community factor. It's more of this is what was important to the participants who were being interviewed. Right. That's what they brought up over and over again. What you do in qualitative research, very literally, is you just ask them very broad questions about the experience. So in this case, they're, they're asking the participants about what is it like to manage your diabetes at home? And then the participants are the one who's bringing up these things. Right. So again and again, the participants who are Filipino they brought up kind of the difficulties in navigating the community while the Chinese Americans again and again really talked about this balance and imbalance in a food. Does that answer your question? I know it's, it's not specifically addressing it. So in a sense, it's what people bring up and then also taking into account the locations that these were, um, these yeah. studies were done in. 
Yeah. And a, a little more than just location. I should, I don't want to like specify that. It's thinking about like things that are kind of probably essential to that community. Right. So you see in this, I'm specifically saying first gen Chinese Americans, right? Because generation, like immigration generation is kind of a way to discuss acculturation or kind of assimilation, whatever word, they're all kind of crappy, but whatever word you use to de describe this, it's like how integrated and how part of typical American culture are they, right? So first gen Chinese Americans, very, very different than someone like me, who's a second gen Chinese American, right? Like I grew up in New Orleans, I have all the bad habits of the New Orleans food, right? Which none of it, it's really healthy, but all of it's really good. Um, but I also have like a lot of these conversations about balancing food. It's how my wife and I talk, right? Like it's never about you can't eat this. It's about everything in moderation. If you eat this, you have to eat this. It's things like that, right? So it's not location, but it's like something that you as a researcher is thinking might be significant to cause potential differences within groups, so generational status, language status, healthcare access, all of these things are possibilities. In this case, it just happened to be differences in location. Any other questions? That was great. I actually just have a comment. So um, thank you so much for talking about this case. I thought it was really relative. Um, so TMI, gonna, you know, you guys are going to enter my personal life. But um, so recently I have been like pre-diabetic because, uh, you know, I, I'm a sweet, I have a sweet tooth and everything. And when I was talking to my doctor, my doctor was like, have you been eating a lot of rice? Because you're in the Asian community, like you're an Asian, you know, I'm like, oh, um, yeah, I've been eating a lot of rice. And it's like, in a way, their management is like, then don't eat rice or like eat less rice. And I'm like, okay, I don't know if that's the best management, but I will look up what else I can do. Yeah. And you're like a health literate person, right? So this is a really important concept is that um, any research can be used positively and negatively. And in this case, like what this person, this, this physician's probably doing is bringing in a lot of different stereotypes. Um, and some of it's true, some it's not true, right? So that's like really important to talk about. There, There's more than just rice, right? Interestingly, a lot of the SoCal research on diabetes focuses on drinks, specifically bubble tea, there's like a whole association looking at the link between bubble tea and diabetes, right? Um, I only know this because I love bubble tea and my parents keep on sending me these papers as they come out. Um, that's all, the only reason I know this. Um, but would it, would it have been more instructive if this person had a resource of like, well, these are foods that I recommend you eat less of but these are foods that I recommend you eat more of, or you like shift your diet towards other foods that are considered more like palatable within kind of some stereotyping going on within like the communities that you're part of. Right. Um, I know my dad does that all the time, but that's because he's a Chinese medicine doc. Um, he's constantly telling me, no, do this, not this. And it'd be really great to provide more like holistic recommendations specifically in this this fear of conversation um yeah but thank you it wasn't tmi and we're already talking about diabetes so okay i'm gonna move on realize it's already 7 39 so i did want to go just touch briefly on really the reason that jan and i had a conversation about doing this talk um so recently, I worked with a pretty large group of people to specifically look at racism amongst medical students who are Asian American during COVID. So for those of you who are third years, um, your classmates were part of these conversations because you guys were first years when I first started doing this study. And then for those of you who are first and second years, 
hopefully you're experiencing this less than myself and the third and fourth and current residents. Um, but I just wanted to talk about it mostly in the context of what's going on within the conversation of racism related to healthcare workers. So there's a lot going on, as in there's like six papers, right? So within the world of Asian Americans, there's a couple of papers that have popped up in addition to the one that I was able to publish. The first one, and in my opinion, probably the most interesting one is really just focused on Filipino Americans. And just very briefly, because these all of these papers cover very kind of themes that all cross each other. Um, this one looks at Filipino Americans, both nurses and physicians, but then also people who work at worked at grocery stores and who are considered frontline workers within like the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And basically they talked about how crappy it was to be seen as repeatedly to be seen as Chinese. Okay. And I think that's a really interesting um, kind of like how people who aren't Chinese receive a lot of like racism focused on anti-China sentiments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this paper spends a lot of time discussing it and having some quotations about it too. This is another paper first focused on nursing students, which found very similar things to my paper, um, really thinking about how often and how prevalent racial racialized microaggressions are within the clinical setting. So things like being called the other Asian person instead of your name, or getting grades that were the other Asian person as opposed to you, right? So that's been studied a lot within kind of other minoritized groups as well. Um, and then also having a lot of difficulties really with kind of speaking up or standing up for yourself in this space where you have a lot going against you, thinking about how there's a lot of stereotypes of Asian Americans not going to like speak up or they're kind of invisible and in the background. Um, this was the first paper that focused specifically on healthcare workers, um, like residents and physicians. And it looked at Canada, Asian Canadians and Asian Americans and found things very, very similar to the nursing student one as well. Um, specific to this one, this one was the earliest study. So the, all the interviews were done in 2020. And it really chronicles that first emergence from microaggression to physical acts of violence that a lot of the Asian American communities and Asian Canadian communities experienced in this first year of the pandemic. And then something that's not a classic qualitative study, um, but this is something that you, any of y'all could do, right? And that's what I wanted to highlight here is that they took UPenn's pre-health curricula, or sorry, pre-clinical curriculum, and just quantified how often Asian Americans were mentioned, right? And then talked about how often they were, the, the Asians was used as a biomarker for some sort of genetic variation. Um, and then also talked about how often Asian Americans were disaggregated or they just said that Asians had a higher predilection for X, Y disease. I just think you should read all of these papers if you're interested in qualitative research, but this last one, the one I just talked about, could be adapted to literally any medical school, um, all the medical schools that you guys go to. So just to briefly go over this one, because I felt that I was supposed to do that. Um, so this is table one. Basically, I just wanted to highlight that we included a disaggregated group of Asian Americans. Significantly, there are no Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, so you won't really see me using that term here. Um, and then secondly, there's a lot of groups that are missing. So these are the communities that are slightly better represented within the Asian American population in medical school. But like, for example, like Cambodian Americans, Hmong Americans, like they're just like, I, I couldn't find any. We tried to target all of the different 
potentially like 17 different ethnic groups. Um, but I now have the quantitative data of what makes up the medical schools. And like the AAMC has four Cambodian American medical students in 2016 to 2020. Right. So like chances of me finding one of those four is like impossible. Okay. So there are some limitations here, but there's an attempt to disaggregate here. There's an attempt to look at all four years of medical school. And importantly to what we were talking about earlier, thinking about acculturation and assimilation, um, it's important to, to know immigration generation, right? So did they grow up outside the United States or in the United States at the very least? Um, and then also thinking in the United, in the context of the United States, what part of the United States were they going to medical school in, which we were luckily able to kind of grab all over the United States. So it's relatively representative. And then I have two slides on table two, which is just some very basic themes. And I assumed a lot of you guys would be on iPhones and stuff. So I'm just going to highlight things. And this is an open access paper that I paid way too much money to make open access. So like, read it, you know, just, just read it. It's fine. Um, and you can just email me and we can talk about it offline. Um, but the thing to highlight here, as I mentioned earlier, is that during COVID, there was this progression from microaggressions that made people feel invisible to aggressions that made people feel really visible. I'm sure all of you guys remember this period, um, but the typical racist event that people described prior to the pandemic were questions that we're all still getting, which is things like, where are you from? Or gendered conversations of like, oh, you look like Dr. Pimple Popper, which was repeated way too many times for my liking. Um, and then this concept of mistaken identity, always being confused for that other Asian person. And just so you know, it doesn't get better as a resident or as a fellow at the very least, like I'm still called any other Asian person who works in the emergency department. It happens basically every shift. And then during COVID really became a much more visible uh, impact, right? So we all felt these like social media events of like our, like elders being beat up on the subway or being attacked and killed. And these were all traumatic events. Um, and then really thinking about there was no support mechanism or no space within the medical environment, the learning environment to go to kind of like debrief and to find support after really traumatic events like this. And that's like really the, if there was one takeaway from this paper, that's what I would take is that throughout it all, as I'm gonna go into in this next slide, there's just an absence of support for Asian Americans at every part of the medical school, all the way from admissions, talking about like, what does it mean to be a overrepresented but underrepresented to uh, what the hell does representation mean for Asian Americans, all the way to going into a residency and applying to residency, how do I navigate that? And then all these little things, right? So absence within the preclinical curriculum, absence when you're looking for mental health resources or support, all of these absences, okay? And just to highlight that a little bit, and we touched on this earlier, is thinking specifically about the curriculum, right? So it's really important as like someone who went to medical school and is now in residency, like I have counted the number of Asian American patients that I have seen. And I, you know, I, I went to medical school in New Orleans and there were four Vietnamese patients as a medical student that I had, right? And then now in residency, all four years of residency, I took care of six Chinese American patients and one Korean American patient, right? So I have a grand total of, I have seen 11 Asian American patients in eight years, right? So that's important to think about when you're thinking about like your education and kind of what your exposure is going to be. 
how important will it be then from a curricular phase when you're doing preclinical medicine to think about these things and be taught these things? Or like, are you going to reinforce a lot of stereotypes in the preclinical curriculum? Are you going to ignore the Asian American community altogether? What's going to happen? Because guarantee you, unless you go to like California or maybe Philly, definitely New York, like everywhere else, you're not going to have a lot of exposure. And the people who aren't taught in the preclinical curriculum, they're just going to reinforce the stereotypes that they grew up with, right? So the preclinical curriculum is really this opportunity for people to have like a, hopefully uh, a curriculum that teaches them beyond stereotypes. And I just want you guys to think about that because one of the things that I found in my study, but also in the five other studies, sorry, the four other studies that I talked about, each one of them talked about the lack of training within this space of not really even training, the lack of mention in this space. And they all called for at least a localized curriculum, right? So something specific to the communities that that med school belonged to, if not a national curriculum. Zion, you raised your hand. Thanks. Uh, I was curious, so I think the question that tends to come up with this is, so what do we cover? Like, what perspective do we share, especially in the cases where we only see four, like, four patients, maybe? Yeah, totally. And look, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I prefer to think about the local communities that I'm part of, right? So... I specifically during medical school focused mostly on the Vietnamese community because there's like, I would say a couple thousand Vietnamese Americans within New Orleans at the very least. Uh, but like I knew all the Chinese American people because I like went to church with them and it's literally one room, right? So what I'll say is I think the baseline education in my perspective should focus on disaggregation and kind of the little known things that we have within the disease processes, right? So moving away from conflating race to genetics, that's like a big thing within conversations about race kind of across the United States. Um, but really thinking about how like can we develop at least a national standard for including Asian Americans in lectures, right? So thinking about like, instead of talking about, I don't know, Asians have a lot of, I don't know, have a lot of suicide or something like that, talking about specific communities or like we know that a lot of the South Asian community deals with cardiovascular disease. We know for diabetes, it's not really the East Asian communities. It's actually the other communities. So just aggregating where you can and providing, if we know it, the cultural context that potentially define the reasons, right? So that's why I think qualitative research is really interesting because it can provide that context. Um, unfortunately, and I'm sure many of you guys here who I assume are part of the PAMS as the local chapters, like most of it just falls on the medical student who happens to be leading a PAMSA that year to do this work, right? So I'm sure just as like my experience, some like diversity leader or some professor was like, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you create this curriculum? And that's like not great in my perspective. That's like called basically minority tax. It's like doing the work for them. Um, so if you create all of the scholarship, right, create a pool of scholarship, you then can create evidence bases to teach evidence-based things related to disease processes. And I'm showing you here that there's already a wealth of research being done in specific disease processes, diabetes being a huge one, hypertension being another big one, stroke is a whole beast in it by itself. Um, but like, I'm a pre-hospital physician. There's a quite a bit of research looking at Asian Americans just within cardiac arrest. 
So I'm sure there's other disease processes that I haven't looked into that have this, right? So it just takes someone to do it. Um, personally, I think it could be like a long-term effort of like, I don't know, a PAMS educational committee or something like that. But like locally, I think communities can start thinking about, or a PAMS can start thinking about the local communities and what are ways to address their needs specifically. Not a great answer. Sorry. No, it totally starts with our local spheres of influence. So I, I really appreciate the reminder to say, look at where you, we are now and go from there first. And the second thing is just that uh, learning context takes time and relationships. And so that's why in this world of like, I just want the answers. I want them now. Yeah. It doesn't always work. Uh, and then finally, the third was just I appreciated the like, hey, when you take break things apart. Yes. But in this process of disaggregating, like even in the pre-hospital, in-hospital, thing, I thought, like that was super cool that I didn't think about before, um, is just that this is this is all being built locally and can be finally put into like a nationwide picture as well. So, yeah. And I think some like groups like APAMSA, groups like SNMA, um, LMSA, for example, that's like the great capacity for them, right? You guys are all health knowledgeable and quickly growing in that knowledge, but also have access to the communities that you guys are part of. And it's like an opportunity to kind of work together to build something. And then a PAMSA as a national group or something, I don't know, something like that. I'm not like, I'm not an educational person, but could bring all of that efforts together and kind of combine it into something that could be disseminated to other communities. Just something to think about. Okay, so I'm going to try to end this to talk about things that I think you guys could be involved in, things that maybe I can help you out in. I'm really focusing on what we just talked about, which is what are the local communities, right? So the question that I have for you guys is what are the communities that are local to you, right? So it's pretty easy to talk about, oh, Houston has this. LA has this, New York has this, but literally like within like 30 minutes driving of your medical school, what communities are there? Okay. I'm not going to ask you to talk out loud unless you want to share and you have thoughts about it and we can totally brainstorm here. Um, but just think about that. Right. So like thinking about like, what are their needs? Are you actually part of that community? Do you know what their needs are? Right. So like, I'm part of a Chinese American community in New Orleans, and I literally know what their needs are because I'm part of it. I don't know all their needs, so I should talk to the community members. I know like within that community over the past 20 years, mental health has been a big need. And that's why a lot of my research focuses on mental health because I'm part of that community. And that's what is interesting to me. And we've had a lot of discussions on depression and suicide amongst like Asian or in this case, Chinese teenagers, but that's my community, right? So you guys are part of communities, whether at medical school or maybe wherever you grew up or something like that. So think about that. Next is, are there any organizations in your area, right? So I mentioned my Chinese church, right? That's an organization. Maybe there's an organizing group. Maybe that's someone you can partner with. Maybe that's someone who can give you money to do stuff. I don't know. Money is great. It helps a lot of things. And maybe that's a group that can put in both money and then also people to do this type of work. And then this is kind of, you know, my thing for this talk is, is there a way to apply qualitative methods, right? Unless you're living in a large community, the, the community that you're thinking about aren't huge. Right. They're like a couple hundred, maybe a couple of thousand. And this is really when qualitative methods become really useful. Right. You could do a survey study and then ask qualitative questions. Just simply, what are needs that you think our group can address? Right. What are your health needs? Just asking that. And then you get a bunch of free text responses. And then if there's like, I don't know, 100 or 200 responses, like, that's a qualitative project that you can really dive into, okay? And then really 
just to emphasize, when we talk about communities and getting involved with them, um, Zion, I think you mentioned this is a long-term thing and this is like an effort. What I'm talking about now is going a little bit beyond qualitative research and something called CBPR, which is community-based participatory research. So how do you address the needs of the community? You have to understand their needs. So you have to get them involved, right? You have to have stakeholders and it's all research that focuses on the participants by having them be part of it. Qualitative research can be done where a member of that community, whether it's you or someone else, they go out into the community, they interview people, they identify those needs, they bring it back to like the local Apamza chapter. And then the next year's research project or health project or whatever can focus on that need, right? So these are just things to think about. A, a more formulaic stepwise approach to a lot of what you guys are probably doing within your communities. And then really that's just addressing what's on the right side, which is one of the recommendations from a paper that I talked about earlier that looked at UPenn's curriculum, right? So I'll read it out loud for the people with iPhones. Really the long-term recommendation is partnering and collaborating with organizations invested in and trusted by Asian American communities to increase research participation, right? We need people to do the research, to report the research, we need the communities to be involved in this research because they're the ones who are going to benefit, right? If we do the research and no one really cares, it doesn't matter. You stop doing the research, right? You have to be involved within the community to do it. And just as like a short example, because, you know, like four months ago, I was like, I should probably practice what I'm preaching more at more as I like do this, like, EMS fellowship and I'm like riding on ambulances and making fun jokes about how firefighters don't look as fit as the firefighter calendars, right? So I went into the communities that I'm part of. Here in New Haven, I go to a martial arts school that does like Tai Chi and stuff because I like doing that. And I talked to the community members there, right? And they were like, oh, well, like we do all this stuff but then some football player got hit and had a cardiac arrest in the field. Like, how do I do that if someone gets hit at my martial arts school? And then we were like, well, there's a crap ton of people who go to the school who like their English is not great. And they have a lot of family members who speak even worse English than them. So what about we do the only thing that works, which is CPR and AED? What about we teach that in Mandarin, right? So like two weeks ago, I basically, because my Mandarin sucks, um, I worked together with a group of Yale and Quinnipiac medical students who did have good Mandarin speaking skills. And we taught this whole class, right? And this isn't research, right? But this is like using forms of qualitative research, right? This is interviewing people, talking to them, what are their needs, and then transforming it into something that happens, right? That is scalable. Now, in addition to this, just because I love teaching hands-only CPR, we're doing it in, um, oh God, it's, we're doing it in Parsi next. It's, I don't speak that language, but it's like we're finding interpreters to do hands-only CPR in all of these different small communities in the New Haven area, right? And that's because I'm interested in CPR and I can do this, but you guys are interested in other things and you can identify the needs of your community members, right? This is just one example. So that's one concept, one potential project that I encourage you guys to think about. And I'm here mostly as a, hey, if you want someone to bounce ideas off, we can chat, we can set up some like Zoomy 30 minute session and just like spitball things that you guys could do. Happy to do that. Um, but there's also other things. So I mentioned my paper, we have all of this like, way too many hours of interviews and people oftentimes do secondary analyses. So from my perspective, this is data that was collected through a PAMSA and I think it should be made available. I, I can't do it publicly, but like can be made available for people who have projects that they're interested that could be answered by this, right? So the ask here, right? In this 
consideration of a secondary analysis is if you have a question, if you have an idea and you think this type of project or this type of data could be used to answer it, then just email me, right? And we can set up a time to chat. We can brainstorm. Some thoughts are, we talked about differences between ethnic groups. We have all of these different groups, maybe like a focal analysis on one of these populations. Some other interesting thing I mentioned briefly earlier was non-Chinese populations, they were experiencing all this racism that was poorly directed at Chinese people, even though they weren't Chinese people, that got weird. But like, how are these communities responding to that specifically? There's a whole bunch of ideas. You guys can come up with it. I'm just trying to make this data a little bit more available for people. And obviously I'd be happy to kind of show you how to do qualitative research because that gets more involved. Other things, um, this is a maybe project is I my mentor just spent $25,000 to recruit way too many people for the survey on why they don't join clinical trials. And you guys might not know this, but Asian Americans don't participate in clinical trials. They don't really like it. I don't know why. No one knows why. There's no studies on it. So my only part in the study was to add a survey question to disaggregate Asian Americans. And now I have all of this stuff. So I can't make this available until we publish the primary study, but eventually I'll have a look at 600 United States living Asian Americans who are disaggregated. So it's like, oh, maybe this could be of use. And this is something that like, you know, like I'm happy to do, but I'm more interested in kind of helping other people do these types of things and get involved too. Lastly, the question that I always ask at the end of every presentation that I have is really just what can I do to help you, right? So I talked about research. I talked about things that I was involved in, really focused on what the purpose of qualitative research is. And I'm now like in this weird phase where I'm eventually going to have a job next year and I'm like applying to grants. And I was thinking like, well, I had about 50 research mentors from first year of med school till now, right? So maybe like I should do something to help out too, whatever. I don't know. I really like Asian American health research. Maybe I can encourage other people to do it too, right? So there's a QR code. You can kind of review my lecture, whatever kind of, I don't know, whatever I put up right then and there. Um, but importantly, if you are like, I have this idea, I want to pursue it. Can you help? You, you can just like put the idea down, put your email down and we can set up a time to talk. Or you're like, I don't know what I want to do, but I really want to do something. We can talk, right? The idea, and I talked a little bit about this with Janet, is I'm thinking about how to create a, like some sort of formal mentorship program so that myself and a couple of the other of Hamza alumni who are heavily involved in research in this space, how can we both use it as a way to like encourage others to do this type of research, but also um, kind of broaden the types of research being done within a focus of Asian American health. So there's a question in this QR code of like, well, like what do you need from us for good mentorship, right? Is that money? Is that time? We don't really have either of them, but we can probably find a way to get them. Um, is it X, Y, Z, right? So really whatever. On that note, I'm done talking 21 minutes early, which is great. Um, any questions for me? Um, form submission there were a few questions that came in um, love it was what clinical slash service slash research opportunities would you recommend for first year medical students who are interested in advancing health equity for asian american communities got it um i feel like i answered that question but there is 
uh, let me see if I can find it on Twitter. I think it's AI, AAPI data, or there's at least one organization right now that's, I actually, I think Apamza's Instagram shared this a couple of days ago or something. There's some sort of research internship opportunity focused on Asian American health. If anyone has quantitative, as in like R, Stata, Python, et cetera, experience, there's a lot of larger data sets that are starting to disaggregate Asian Americans. And you can just like put that in the QR code and I can just let you know which ones they are. Um, if you're interested in more specific things, but you don't want to talk to me, which is totally fine, just go to the NYU Asian American Health Center. There's a whole center dedicated towards research on Asian Americans. They're my favorite one. And they have a whole list on data sets. They have a whole list on kind of best practices when it comes to disaggregation. And some of the research that I presented today that I showed you guys is coming from their shop, right? So they're like the first federally funded research center focused on Asian Americans. Um, so that's probably the best place to start. Um, but the anti-Asian hate, I forget the group. And then the Asian American Foundation is also another group that's like been pretty popular. If you live in California, just, I don't know, talk to the researchers there doing it. But for those who don't live in California, those are your resources. Any other questions? Could I ask like a really random question on your your disaggregation of the data totally um, it's like oh yeah yeah i knew this would come up we'll go back <laughs> i was just curious like why they see and then why i figured there's a reason like they see versus indian nepalese and Pakistani. yeah so th this is self-identified ethnicity so this is during the interview i asked them how do you identify and one person said oh i'm desi american um, because it's more inclusive, but I'm Indian American. So I just put both. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, everyone had questions about it, but I learned a lot because I didn't know that Desi American was even a term. Uh, but that's how this person identified. So I put it down. Got it. I was like, oh, should I, because I didn't consider using that either. So I was like, oh, should I, should I be considering that for if I want to do this? But that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, it's very fluid, right? So like I consider myself Chinese American, but a lot of the time I say I'm East Asian American. And then I also sometimes say that I'm Han Chinese American. It's like all sorts of confusing for people, uh, but it makes sense if you are within the space, right? So it's all about context. This person was having a conversation with me specifically not just about the Indian American experience, but about being South Asian as a whole. And he just hated the word South Asian and he much preferred Desi American, which is why we're using it. Got it. Thank you so much. Of course. Sorry if you guys are hearing my cat. It's meowing the storm. I have a rough interest um and i don't know how to actually go into it or look it up or yeah just don't have any experience on this but i was interested in looking at different screening protocols or for cancer in mm. different asian american populations um i think this really just came up again tmi into my life. Um, my, my mom, she's a breast cancer survivor, but she didn't know until a little bit late, but um, really happy that she uh, beat it. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's just those personal things that kind of jumpstart your, your passion for certain things. And I just wanted to look into, yeah, just cancer screening in general, uh, whether that means like early on cancer screening or like, you know, can, is there a way that we can compare ethnic groups of like, how early do they screen? How early should we screen? 
um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. My cat's presenting him herself. Um, so related to that, um, I'm going to ask one of my co-researchers who is an oncologist about this. And if she's okay with it, I'll connect you because she's an oncologist and I'm not. Uh, that's the basic premise of it. The Honestly, the first steps for someone who... I'm from your comment earlier, doesn't have a lot of research experience, it sounds like. I would just start with a literature search, which is literally just PubMed and just like looking into it and seeing what has been done already. Um, you're actually looking for a protocol review. So you're looking at like all of these societies, what are their guidelines? And do they have anything specific to Asian Americans? That's the first step. And then what are the differences within Asian Americans? And then is there any research to support different guidelines for being both Asian American and then kind of within that population? Um, so for that, kind of the basic start after a lit review is to figure out the societies that do cancer screening guidelines, right? There's more than one because there's always, there's always more than one. And look at those first, right? And basically you'll come up with a screening protocol of your own. As you go through all of these guidelines, what are the data points that you wanna pull out? And um, that basically will be the way you compare the different guidelines. Um, there's probably not a lot because there's just not a lot related to kind of disaggregated populations within screening guidelines anyway, um, which is why I think the diabetes one was so significant um, that it's just changed specifically, not for Asian Americans, but for Asian American females specifically. Uh, I suspect you'll find that there are no guidelines, um, but um, I'll, I'll talk to my friend, we're meeting, I think a week from now, um, so I'll just see if she's interested in us capacity to chat with you about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Of course. Any other questions? I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about what it was like to, uh, I don't know if approach is the right word, but work with learning another culture within Asian culture. Um, I think so the primary community that exists here is Korean and I'm not Korean. And mm. I think there are, I want to be culturally competent. <laughs> and so I am trying, so just like, how do you approach learning more about another people group when you present yourself as Asian? So like the context would be like, I present myself as Asian, but I'm trying to become more familiar with like the Korean American population. Yes. Like yeah. Um, I think, I mean, this is like applicable to every context, but it's just being very forthright that you're going to mess up and you're going to make up, make a lot of mistakes. That's like the first thing. And just being very, very willing to apologize and that should be kind of like your first thing right so um from like a person perspective it's just spending your time and immersing yourself in that community which is easy but as medical students you guys don't have a lot of time right and then thinking about thinking a little critically about what perspectives do i have on this community and are they derived from experiences or are they derived from stereotypes? Um, I think the classic example for my life is that when I was in college, I was part of the Korean Students Association because they drank a lot and I had a lot of fun hanging out with them. Um, and so a lot of my experiences, my direct experiences were like, I just like drinking with them. Like, I love Korean. American culture, right? And then I hung out with, oh, I went to Korea and then I like 
imposed a lot of those experiences from college on a much larger group. Um, and it didn't, you know, it didn't always go well, right? Because not everyone in Korea drinks, for example, as like one big thing. Um, so like, just that is like a very kind of a stupid, funny comment related to the fact that like there, there are differences and you just have to kind of step away a little bit and think about where your biases come in. And that applies to not just Asian American things. From a research perspective, it was very interesting because I was diving into people's experiences with racism on like a, after like a two minute, hey, how are you doing? Like, how's life kind of conversation? Um, for me, it was very therapeutic. It was like the best peer therapy ever. Um, but at the same time, like many of my participants talked about suicide and depression and leaves of absences and things like that. And it was like, it was reasons for that that come from like, even though they were like, I don't know, like name an Asian ethnic group but like they were all considered Asian American for the purposes of medical school. Like it was such different experiences and it was sharply defined by their ethnicity. Um, a lot of it is kind of paralleling the conversations we just had about diabetes. It like was pretty significant, like kind of the familial aspects and how that influences mental health um, conversations about like, kind of how you bear stigma varied a lot, right? And these are all like very much like one person talking about it. And now here I am thinking about it and how it applies to a whole community, which is where I have to take a step back, right? And this is where, and why like, you don't have to read this paper, but if you ever read this paper I wrote, none of that's in it, right? Because none of it's grounded in research. It's all grounded in kind of biases that I'm developing. So it's important to understand like where your biases come from and to know that like every person's experience is significant, um, but it's important not to conflate that with like, this is a prevailing theme within a community. Really appreciate you sharing all that. It's definitely a fine balance for sure. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions, I'm gonna let you guys go seven minutes early.